The micro mouse contest is great fun, but you need a maze to run your mouse in. I'm going to show you how we designed and built a versatile and modular maze for the micro mouse contest. You're going to see why the maze can be something of a problem, especially if you want to practice at home. I'm going to have a look at the design of a modular maze, which is good for contests and home practice, and we'll have a close look at how the individual parts are made and fitted together. A micro mouse maze is usually a wooden structure consisting of several panels joined together. The panels have holes drilled in at regular intervals, posts are placed in the holes, and walls connect the posts. For the classic micro mouse contest, the maze is going to be around about 3 metres square, that's 10 foot. It's quite big and not at all easy to shift. A typical contest maze will arrive in a crate. The panels will then have to be taken out and arranged carefully in order, joined to make sure that they are well aligned, and then finally the maze is assembled. Next, all of the posts are inserted and the walls placed between them in order to make up the final maze for the contest. This maze from the Apex contest in America is typical of most contest mazes around the world. You can see that it's made up of nine panels and each of these is really heavy. It takes two people to lift one. Not only are they heavy, they're quite difficult to store and the crate that you saw earlier is probably not a good solution for most people. There have been several different designs in the UK for classic micro mouse mazes. More recently we too have developed a nine panel structure but you need a fairly large car to move them and they're still quite heavy so we started to look around for something simpler more accessible, something that people could store and use at home, something that would be flexible and would fit in an ordinary saloon car. After a lot of discussion, we finally settled on a design that involved tiles, which were joined together by interlocking tabs underneath. Using just two layers, we could be fairly sure that the vertical alignment would be good and the posts would be used in holes in the tabs to make sure that the horizontal alignment was also good. These parts had to be CNC cut for accuracy. Once the parts had been cut, they had to be painted. So that meant priming, then overcoat, and then drying. And then finally, they could be assembled together into a small test maze. This maze worked really well and held together nicely with good vertical and horizontal alignment. But it was going to be a bit of a nuisance to make. The painting was the worst thing. Several stages of paint application and drying, the amount of time it took, the space it took for them to dry out, all meant that it wasn't really very practical. So after a small redesign, the tab arrangement was improved, and we managed to find a material 6mm thick, which was made of solid black MDF, black all the way through, and the surface was good enough that it didn't really need any painting or finishing. So finally, we had a design that we could actually make. All the parts had to be CNC cut, and preferably on the same machine, so that if there were any errors, slight out of squareness, or a slight oversize or undersize, they would at least be consistent between the tiles. We were going to need a CNC machine, and quite a big one at that. So the first job was to make a table to sit it on. Luckily, I had a bunch of wood hanging around in the workshop, and I'd been wondering what to do with it. So I started with a torsion box top, added some legs and a shelf underneath, gave it a coat of varnish, and the job was done. Eventually I came across a second-hand Workbee CNC routing machine. This was big enough to do the tile without any trouble at all, with a cutting area of nearly 4 foot by 2.5 feet. It soon became clear that it wasn't going to be feasible to hold down the parts by clamping them around the edges because the outline went all the way around the piece and it would be left floating. So I ended up building a vacuum table to hold the blanks down so that they could be cut out. MDF is quite porous material so it was mostly a question of cutting out a suitable plenum and then on top of that a piece of scrap 6mm MDF would serve as the actual cutting surface. The vacuum is easily pulled through the MDF and holds the part firmly in place. Now it was time to get serious. After asking around and to work out how many pieces we needed, I placed an order for 180 blanks. When they arrived, 
although I thought I already knew what I was expecting. I was a little surprised by the weight. I'd miscalculated slightly in my head and ended up with somewhere in the region of 300 kilograms of MDF. That was going to be 180 blanks, enough to make 90 tiles. I'd been asked to make 85, so I didn't have an awful lot of margin for error for messing any up. Machining the parts was a pretty noisy business. There's a vacuum cleaner to get the dust out from the router. There's a vacuum cleaner attached to the vacuum table. And then there's the router spindle itself. All in all, it makes quite a row. After a bit of practice, I got into a routine. The entire tile could be made in the time it takes to cut out the two layers. We start by boring out the post holes. Two passes and two finishing passes gives us a good chance of hitting the final size accurately, though they always seem to be slightly undersized at the end. After boring out the post holes, I can cut the outline. This takes three passes in total. The first pass goes down three and a half millimeters. The second pass goes right through and into the wasteboard to try and give a good lower cut surface. And then finally there's a finishing pass which just takes off the last 0.2 millimeters or so. Before that final pass, it's important to remove the waste pieces. If they're left where they are, they're not held down by the vacuum table and they can get caught up in the cutter and that can cause the cutter to crash which may damage the tile or the router or the bit or some other disaster. This final finishing pass also gets rid of quite a lot of the dust left by the first two passes. Being a straight sided cutter, the chips and dust and muck aren't really very well evacuated out of the cut, so the final finishing pass not only brings the part to size, but also cleans up the mess. Once the cutting's done, I have a quick clean around with a vacuum hose, removing the last of the dust and debris, and cleaning out the holes so that they're easier to deal with later. Once it's good and clean it can be removed from the table and then taken away for a bit more prep whilst we get the next part cut. The bottom layer doesn't need a huge amount of work but while it's being done we might just as well have the top layer being cut out ready for the full assembly. Although they've all been stored nice and flat, the parts always seem to come off the machine with a slight cup to them. So the first job is to find the top surface or the bowed surface and put that down on the table. This will become the outer surface later. Preparation is mostly a question of sanding it down with some 240 grit paper and yet another vacuum cleaner adding to the noise. The edges of the tabs are given a bit of a chamfer so that they will slide easily together when the completed tiles are slid against each other when we assemble the maze. It's important to be methodical when preparing these pieces. The surface that's being sanded now will end up being the inside of the completely assembled tile. So once it's done, it needs to be turned over and set to one side so that it can be placed correctly on the other half of the tile when the time for assembly comes. It's not long before the top half can come off the table and be taken over and assembled together with the bottom half into a single complete tile. It too will have a cup so we make sure that 
the outermost surface, the cupped part, is face down on the table and then give the thing a bit of a sand over. It's important now to make sure that all the edges are broken and given a little bit of a round over. If there are any steps in the maze when it's put together, we want those to be nice and gentle. There's no need to sand the complete surface. We'll just check it for any lumps and bumps. That's going to be the inside of the tile. We will, however, just take the burrs off any of the holes to make it easier to put them together in a moment. A pair of ordinary 6mm wooden dowels go in two of the holes. That makes it easier to align the other half when we're putting them together. It's easy to get confused, but eventually it'll come right. Eventually. With the two parts aligned, I just draw around the outline of the lower half so that I can see where to put the glue. I don't really want glue to be squeezing out all around everywhere. Certainly I don't want it on those spaces. So it's easiest to just mark it up, take the thing apart, then apply the glue. The dowels are put back in a different pair of holes, partly a question of the routine, and partly just to make sure that all the holes manage to get a, a dowel through them to clean them up during assembly. A bead of glue runs around the whole outline that we've just drawn. Not too close, but enough to make sure that we've got good contact and good adhesion around the outside edges of the tile. And a few beads around the inside, enough to make sure that it's not going to pop apart. It doesn't take an awful lot, and there's no need to spread it out into a thin film. Now the bottom half is laid on top, properly aligned, and nailed in place. The nail gun makes all this much easier. 10mm nails go through and hold the two parts together. Remember the cup? Well, the cup, the bows are both pointing outwards, so the nails help press the pieces together and ensure that the edges are nicely aligned. And to make sure that the edges are held together. Remember to use the nail gun perpendicular to an edge. If a nail comes shooting out at a strange angle, it's most likely to do so sideways. And so we want to make sure they don't protrude out of the edges of the maze pieces. Good firm pressure here, and everything will be held together forever. This is now the underneath side of the tile and it needs a good sand down because the nail gun tends to leave raised uh, burrs or lumps around the nail entry points. The nails will all be well below the surface but even so we can do without having any kind of protrusion that makes a, the tiles rub together when they're stacked up and moved around. Around about this time, the next piece on the router is getting near finished. This is where you get to remove all of those loose bits around the edge. Now 
Any glue that's squeezed out here can be left where it is because there will be room between adjacent tiles so we don't need to bother with it. After sanding I give it a wipe down with a damp cloth just to remove any of the dust. Now I can give the top running surface some attention. It already feels smooth to the touch, but it turns out that if you were to run a cloth over it, the little tiny fibres on the surface of the MDF would pick up lint. So another good sand over with some 240 grit ensures a very nice smooth finish. Again, we give it a bit of a check over and a wipe down with a damp cloth to make sure there's no dust left behind. Turns out my supply of Nakatomi Plaza souvenir t-shirts has come in quite handy. Unlike the bottom surface, it's important to remove any squeeze out here because these edges are going to be very close up against the edges of an adjacent tile when the maze is assembled, so there mustn't be anything getting in the way. And there we are, another tile done. It's not feasible to test fit every tile against every other tile. Even so, every now and again a batch is taken out, put together into a small maze just to see how well they fit together. So far, everything seems to look good. The goal is to have a gap between adjacent tiles of no more than half a millimetre and a step from one tile to the next of no more than a third of a millimetre. Both these values are well within the stated rules and so far we've managed to get there. At the time of making this video I have around about 30 tiles still to make. They'll all be taken down to our autumn event in Hazelmere on October the 7th and be put together to make a complete contest maze for the first time. 